Hello again, my dear students. Now this is a continue for our uh, rectangular wave guide lecture. In the previous two parts of our lecture, we started with the general solution for Maxwell's equation. And we call it general because actually we do the solution regardless of any boundary condition for any geometry or any structure. After that, we go directly to our uh, Structure under study, which is the rectangular wave guide. In this structure, we have studied the general solution for the magnetic field and in the z direction, which is called the edge of z, using what's called the separation of variable mass. And then we use this edge of z to get the other four components, knowing that we have ez is equal to zero as we are dealing with the Te moves. Now, what we are going to do is to make use of such electrical and magnetic field components in order to determine some critical and important factors. Now, please accept my invitation to share my presentation slide and start continuing our waveguide. Okay, so I believe now you can see my presentation slides. Now in the uh, full screen mode. Okay, that's okay. And then we can now open our laser pointer. Perfect. Okay, so uh, in a very quick manner, using this uh, four Maxwell's equation on the what we call the phaser form, we have determined the general general solution. And based on this general solution, we have classified three main solutions, including the TEM solution, which is out of scope in our rectangular waveguide lecture. And then we have the TE mode and also the TM. We start, okay, then we start with our geometry here. This is our geometry and we start by the set of equation in addition to the wave equation after combining the wave propagation K and the uh, the wave number, sorry, K, and the propagation coefficient beta in what's called the cutoff wave uh, propagation or the cutoff wave number, Kc. Then now we have five unknowns and five equations, or simply we have here one unknown with an equation. We can calculate this edge of that. So we start to calculate this edge of that using what's called separation of variable till we reach the generic solution in terms of sinusoidal T. And using the boundary condition, we have eliminated such a solution into a simpler form with a, a, a sinusoidal coefficient fun function in A and B, which are the di dimension in X and then. And after that, we go to calculate what's called the cutoff frequency. Here we, 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 we rely on the fact that this beta should be always real because please remember that this beta is represent what's called the propagation coefficient and it is, it is exists in our, uh, in our uh, equation in terms of e power minus j beta z. So beta in this equation should be real, otherwise this propagation coefficient will turn to be an attenuation coefficient. Accordingly, beta equals root k square, k square minus kc squared. And to guarantee that beta is all the time real, then you ha should have k greater than kc, which is a condition for propagation. Based on this condition and knowing that the k is equal to omega root nu epsilon, you can determine what's called the cut of uh, frequency. I think we can we make it here. Okay, so yeah, this is a cut of frequency. So this is the frequency needed in order to operate the moves of your TM. Here, as you can see, this cut of frequency is a discrete frequency function is in M and N, which determines simply the order of the of the moves. And knowing that A is greater than B based on the geometry, we can say that the minimum mood, or what we call the fundamental mood, is the one zero mood. Actually, in this lecture, we will consume a, a huge amount of time dealing with this important fundamental mood, which is the one zero mood. Okay, so as you can see here, this is the cutoff frequency, and we can reach that fundamental frequency where M is equal to one and N is equal to zero. Again, this is a fundamental mood because A is greater than B. So we will have this, this cutoff frequency. 
Then using this, if you were to write, yeah, using this H of Z, which we already have determined, and knowing the, the, the fact that we have a link between H of Z and the other four transverse components, then you can calculate now the whole, the whole five component for a rectangular waveguide for a TE mode. As you know, EZ is equal to zero because this is a TE mode, and down this is the value for the other five components. Okay. Actually, so this was the end of the, lecture, the part number two for this lecture. Now let's start our next step. What is our next step? Very simple. Now we are going to use this five components in, in doing or in implementing some physical uh, uh, parameter or in determining some physical parameter. As I told you, my dear student, from a mathematical perspective, this E and H are just a electrical and magnetic field component. But we still did not catch any physical meaning beyond this component. What we are going to do in this lecture, or actually in this course, is to investigate this such a mathematical component in order to determine some other uh, physical component or physical problem. So let's start doing that and let's start with what's called the impedance or the impedance of the rect moons. Here we have what's called the ZTE or the TE impedance. Simply from your parallel exercise, you know that e, ZE is equal to EX over H1, or it can be also equal to minus EY over HX. So by simply by dividing this EX component over the HY component, you can get this simple term, which is K eta over beta. We don't, don't forget that eta is what's called the intrinsic impedance, which is root mu over X. What is interesting, actually, my dear student, in this curve or in this Z, that this Z is a frequency dependent. Here we have a Z or the impedance is dependent on the frequency. Of the okay. Now let's turn to another important issue. And now let me use my simple whiteboard in order to understand. Okay. Okay. This one. Now, if you remember, we have three important functions defined in this mode. If you remember, we have the, what's called Kc, or what's called the cat of wave number. We have K, which is the uh, normal or the initial wave number. And we have beta, which is the propagation coefficient. Okay, perfect. Now, from our EM2 course, maybe you know that this k is equal to omega root mu epsilon, and it's equal also to 2 pi over lambda, where lambda represents simply the wavelengths of the propagating wave. Very, very easy. Now, we will define a new lambda. We will say that beta, which is the propagation coefficient, is equals also to 2 pi over lambda g. So, from this definition, we are now defining a new lambda, which is called the guided wave. The wavelength in general has a constant definition, which is the distance between two successive points in a wave. So whenever you have a, a propagating wave, so this distance is called lambda. But as you can see here now, we have two lambdas. And actually, these two lambdas are not equal. Why am I I'm sure that they are not equal? Because simply, if you remember what we say, few lecture, a few slides ago, when we say that beta should be, or should beta equals root kc squared minus k squared, which means that beta, of course, not equal k. 
because if beta equals to k, this will lead to what's called, if you remember, the TEM mood. So in this condition, beta and k are not equal, which logically, logically mean that lambda g and lambda are not equal. So what is the difference between the lambda appear with a k equation and the lambda g appear with a beta equation? Here is the subscript g, or what's called gyrable. When you study this k parameter related to the wave equation, if you remember, we were here dealing with what's called uh, electromagnetic waves propagating in unguided medium. Maybe this unguided medium is an air or any other medium, a loose or a lost medium. However, in this chapter, in this course, we are dealing with another type of electromagnetic waves which are moving or propagating in a guided medium. So simply this new lambda reflects the wavelength of the wave inside the guided medium. And here you can easily understand that due to the guided medium, the wave propagation will differ and that's why we will have a different lambda rather than the lambda uh, exists with the K or the wave number factor. So let me return back to my slide. As you can see here, we have lambda g, which is equal to two pi over beta. And we have lambda, uh, and we have uh, uh, lambda, which is equal to pi over k. And knowing that k is greater than beta, then two pi over beta will be greater than two pi over k. And accordingly, that means that we are propagating in a uh, we, 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 or the wavelength is expanded or extended whenever they are propagating on side a guided wave. So this is a very important conclusion. Maybe you have to rem re remember uh, this important relation. I'm not sure. Yes. Okay. Let's do it here. Okay. So yes, here. This is the relation. Now k square minus beta squared not equals to zero, if you remember. And this kc should be a rail. That means that k squared is greater than beta squared or k is greater than b. That's why here in, in this slide, we say that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we say that two by over beta should be definitely greater than two by over two. Okay, that's the first important conclusion. Okay, one more conclusion, one more, uh, one more important definition, which is what, which is what's called the wave velocity or the phase velocity. I'm sorry, the phase velocity. So, let me before defining the phase velocity, let me start to think, to ask you or. Before defining it mathematically, let me start asking you what is the wave velocity? What is the definition of the wave velocity? Okay, I believe that Wikipedia is the best one who can answer this question. So I will share with you some nice graph dealing with the uh, wave uh, with the phase velocity. You can easily access this uh, chart using uh, your uh, Google by just Googling uh, the, the word phase velocity and then you can use the first link, which is the Wikipedia link. And through the Wikipedia link, you will have the graph that I will show it in seconds. So what I'm going to do now is just I'm trying to illustrate the physical meaning of the way the, 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 uh, the phase velocity. So what is the phase velocity? Okay, this is the graph. So I'm not sure if I can make it larger. Yes, I can make it larger. Okay, so, and I can now, it's now ready, I can share my screen. I believe, yeah, that you can see this. Good. Okay, so this is very simple, my dear students. As you can see, what we are doing is just we are calculating the velocity of a certain point of, on the way. For example, this reddish point, it will uh, return back here, this reddish point. What is the velocity of this phase, this propagation? That's why we call it the phase velocity. Based on definition, phase velocity is equal to the phase, which is omega, over its rate of propagation, which is beta. That's why 
v phase or, or v phase v phase or the phase velocity is equal to omega over beta. So now I believe I can return back to my uh, slides. I believe you can see it. Okay, now and then this is the definition for phase velocity, which is omega over beta. Again, the phase velocity now is greater than that the same phase velocity for a unguided motion, where we have for the unguided motion our propagation coefficient is k. So omega over k is smaller than omega over beta. So that simply means that the phase velocity is higher inside the guided medium with respect to the unguided. Another important definition related to the uh, propagation of the wave in guided medium and in unguided medium. So what is next? Okay, let's turn back to this slide with this beta. And here, if you remember, this kc definition, when we say that k should be greater than kc, this is a condition to have a real beta, if you remember, my dear student. And accordingly, we have determined the cutoff frequency, and we say that the fundamental mode is what's called the TE1 view mode. Again, we believe that this is the fundamental mode because simply a is greater than b, then 1 over a is smaller than 1 over b. So, what we are going to do now is that we are going simply to, to, to study the TE10 mode. How we, can go, how we can make such a study? It's very simple. Now, we define the, the mode 1, 0 as m is equal to 1 and n is equal to 0. And we already have find all these five components for the electromagnetic waves, knowing that the sixth component, which is EZ, is equal to zero. So, very simple. If you would like to get the TE10 mode, what you are going simply to do is that you are going to substitute with M by one and with N is by zero. Very simple like that. So, this five equation will be somehow reduced by substituting with these two values. So now, for m is equals to one and n is equal to zero, here is what's interesting is zero. So let's start with the zero. So as you can see here, cosine zero is equal to one. So simply this term will be equal to one. Sine zero is equal to zero. Then this whole term will be canceled. So ex will be equal to zero. Again, cosine zero is equal to one. Cosine zero is equal to one. And finally, sine zero is equal to zero, then another term will be canceled. So now, especially for TE10, you will find that EX is equal to zero and HY is equal to zero. And for the, for the M, is that we will just substitute for M is equal to one in HZ, in HZ, EY and HY and HX. So by simple substitution, you will reduce to this only these three components. So this is a very simple. That's why actually we are considering this mode. First, that it's a very simple mode in substitution. Secondly, because this is actually this is a very important mode in the microwave uh, theory and in the microwave application. That's why we consider this mode as a special mode and we call it the fundamental mode. Again, this is because it has the minimum cutoff frequency. So now we have these three components illustrating the H and E. We have H, Z, U, Y, and E, X. What we are going to do in the next slide, my dear students, is simply we are using these three components in order to determine some important parameters. So let me return back to my whiteboard and start proceeding with this determination process for different variables and different parameters that can be. Uh, uh, that can be calculated using these three components. Okay, so perfect. Okay, let's start with calculating the fundamental components, which are very easy. So in order to make life easy for you, I will just try to uh, write down all uh, these uh, uh, components. So we have HZ equals to a10 cosine by over ax or by x over a. And finally, of course, we have this e power minus j beta z term illustrating the propagation of the energy. 
for that. Of course, I, I don't need to mention that H is in that direction. So that's why I'm writing just amplitude. So E1 is equal to minus J omega mu by over Kc squared times A. Again, we have the A10 term and then sign by x over a e power minus j beta z. And finally, we have the term hx, which is j beta by over kc squared a, and of course the same term, which is a10 sine by x over a times e power minus j beta. So this is simply the three remaining components after reducing to a specific mode, which is the TE10 mode. So these three components are related to the TE10. Okay, let's go. Then let's start determining some important parameters. Let's start with, for example, the beta. If you remember, beta equals two root k squared minus kc squared, if you remember this relation. So let me remind you again by going back to our presentation to the, to just to determine uh, or to remember actually the other, uh, the, the other equation. So here, the, if you remember, beta equals k squared minus kc squared. So it's equal to k squared minus m by over a minus n by over b whole squared. So it's very simple like that. So now we have m is equals to one and n, n is equal, equals to zero. So this simple will be reduced and this simple will be, oh, and this will be by over a k squared minus pi over a whole square. Very simple like that. So what now what we can call or what we can write that kc beta is equal root k squared minus pi over a whole square in a very simple and direct manner. Okay, so what's next? Or what we can also calculate in this, in this manner. We also can calculate now the wavelengths. So what we also can calculate is, of course here, this is very simple that this Kc is equal to pi over a. This is actually very simple. Okay, so we also can calculate that Wavelength lambda. If you remember, lambda equals lambda g, I mean, which is the guided wavelength, equals 2 pi over beta. So we already know beta, so simply it's 2 pi over this term. And also we can calculate the v phase or the phase velocity as is equals to omega over beta. And of course, again, we know we know we know beta beta, so we can directly substitute here. So these are the, the first fundamental parameters that we can calculate the guided wavelength, the guided uh, velocity, and principally, of course, the propagation coefficient of the wave. These are the first three important parameters we can calculate from the E and the H components. What, what's next? We also can calculate a very important parameter, which is the power. So let's now start thinking about the power, which is maybe one of the most important physical parameters that we can calculate. So in order to make uh, life easy, I will just with this paper like this, so that you can still see the three components here. And we are now going to write the equation of the power. I believe that all of you already know the equation of the bar from your previous courses, that, that power, and I will call this as a P10, so this is the power associated with the one zero mode. This power is equal to the integration of half real E Y times H X complex conjugate to in terms to D Y D X D Y. Okay, the question is why you choose H X and D Y? Simply because I only have H X and D Y. Because when we calculate the uh, TE mode component, we found that H 
uh, x, uh, uh, we found that ex is equal to zero, and we found that also h was equal to zero. So this order remaining complete. And of course, I believe you already know the information that this power is propagating in that direction. That's why we are we are multiplying e y cross h x, and the multiplication is in the x y domain, which is the domain perpendicular over the uh, the domain perpendicular over the uh, direction of propagation. Here, the direction of propagation is that. So the domain perpendicular over the direction of propagation is simply the x y. So now you have the most component. You have uh, EY and you have HX. So what you can simply do is that you are going to multiply these two factors together. Uh, logically speaking, this real, uh, uh, this real parameter is very important. Here you have J and here you have J. So when you multiply both of together, you, have, you will have J minus one, uh, J squared, which is uh, minus one. So you will, you will not have you, you will not have any imaginary component. So this is just a direct multiplication. And the only, the only, and again, please remember that uh, e power minus g, uh, e power minus g beta, that will not be considered, will not be considered in this integration because simply you are making here with the uh, real part. So the imaginary part will be uh, uh, kicked out of the equation. And simply what you will have is the integration of sine squared. As you can see that both functions are not functional in one. So this dy uh, integration, well, it has no effect. And the only remaining function here is sine squared by x over a dx. This is the only remaining integration. All other terms are constant. So you can easily kick out this constant outside the integration here. These are constants. And here you have an integration dx dy, but simply it's a single integration because your function is only a function. So I believe now we can uh, return back to our, um, uh, now we can return back to our uh, presentation and show you the steps of the integration, which is somehow very easy. So let's do it here. Okay, perfect. So as you can see, my dear students, as I just told you, this is the integration. And now what we are going to do is just, we get all these constants outside the integration, and then we get only this integration for dy dx. That integration is only a function in x, so the integration of, uh, of y will automatically result with b, as you can see here, and you can perform this sinusoidal integration by way or another. We are not interested are we, in details with the, uh, the, 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 the integration of this sine wave. What is really important here is this real beta function. As you can see, why am I, why am I considering only the beta with this real function? Let's see, because, Omega is passed, is, 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 is real all the way. Omega is 2 by f, and f is the frequency, and f will not be complete, so omega is real all over the way. Mu is, a, is a, a, the permeability, which is, of course, a real parameter. A squared is a dimension, and A is a coefficient, which is constant, and again, uh, B is a dimension. But what about this? Can beta be a, a, an imaginary number? Yes. Please remember the slide. Here. This is the condition for which beta will be real. But if k is smaller than kc, beta will turn to imaginary. When this happens, this is, will happen simply if your propagating frequency is smaller than the cutoff frequency. So this condition at which we have the cutoff frequency is related to the condition for which beta is pulsed and beta is real. If the propagating frequency is smaller than the cutoff frequency, then what will happen simply is that you will have an imaginary beta. And consequently, if you have an imaginary beta, then real beta will be equal to zero, and then you will have no power propagating. So 
power will only propagate if beta is great is real and beta will be only real if your frequency is greater than the or equal to the cutoff frequency that's why the the concept of the cutoff frequency is very important in the rectangular wave guys or maybe in the wave guys in general because this is the main condition for which you will have a propagating wave otherwise you will not have a propagating wave okay so this this is what about the problem. now let's turn to a new topic which is the attenuation okay what do you mean by attenuation do we have really do we really have an attenuation mm -hmm. actually a very very important and a critical part in our lecture what is attenuation okay so in order to understand the attenuation we have to first define what is attenuation why should we have it the attenuation is the decaying of the electrical power or the electromagnetic waves power versus this so you have an electromagnetic waves power called p dash this propagates for a distance x after the distance x if it's remain a p dash as a real value power then there is no attenuation but if it's currently p double dash where p double dash is smaller than p dash then you have attenuation then the next question is what are the sources of attenuation it's very simple actually it doesn't it doesn't need an electromagnetic uh, background in your way in your uh, in your rectangular wave down you have two types of material you have a conductor surface on the outer surface of the conductor of, of, of the rectangular wave line please remember the boundary condition when we say that please take care the electrical field or over, over the surface are equal to zero because these are conductors and no electrical field exists on the conductor please remember so this outer surface is simply a conductor what about the inner volume it's it's any dielectric material This electrical material, maybe for example, air or any electrical material with new and that. Okay, very nice, very, very, very easy and very logic. Then, as far as we have two materials, then we have two full sources of loss. How? The first source of losses you already studied in depth in your EM2 course. When I told you, please take care that epsilon is equal to epsilon dash minus the epsilon double dash. Okay, and then, then this k will turn to be a alpha minus j beta because simply k equal omega root mu epsilon. So whenever you have an epsilon complex, you will have a k complex in this manner. And accordingly, e power minus j K will turn to be e power minus alpha minus j beta. That's why you have an attenuation coefficient and a propagation coefficient. You then simply for all the data we have studied in this uh, lecture or in this chapter with the rectangular wave guide, you can generally and I believe I already mentioned this in maybe in part number one or part number two. You can simply substitute beta with gamma, where gamma is equal to alpha minus j beta. Here you have an attenuation coefficient and you have a propagation coefficient. And this attenuation coefficient is simply due to the dielectric material or due to what we call a complex epsilon. So this is the first reason. What about the second reason? If you remember, I told you that we have two sources of material, then we have two sources of losses. 
We already studied in depth in EM2 the first tool, which was the, uh, the electrical uh, constant or the complex uh, permittivity, the complex epsilon, which leads to uh, uh, the uh, appearance of this attenuation coefficient in addition to the provocation coefficient. Now, what about the other term, which is a conductor? Does conductor include losses? Of course, yes. Any conducting materials has a resistance. So it has a loss because you have some of the energy consumed in the term of a heat energy inside the material. This is simply known whenever you start your Ohm's law experiment with the resistance. You know that the power consumed in this resistance is in the term of a heat energy losses for the material. So the other source of error, my dear students, is simply this surface. And as, as far as we are not dealing with a volume, this is just a very thin surface surrounding the medium, turn it to be a guided medium. So we will call the current flowing in this uh, surface, what's called the surface current. And the, the resistance of such a surface, what's called the sheet, or maybe the surface resistance. So, knowing the current and the surface uh, and the resistance, sorry, we can simply write a very simple equation saying that the total power losses is equal to Rs, which is the sheet resistance or the surface resistance, over 2 with the integration of the J, which is the current density, square dot dl over a total complete. What is this equation? This is the resistance. Actually, this is a very simple equation you already know, which is C equals R square R. Typically the same. Typically the same. So this is the I square. This is the current square. Now, this resistance is per unit length. That's why we are now applying here by length. <clears throat> I'm sorry, and this two is a very famous two. Whenever you have one over root two as a root mean square times one over root two, you have half, if you remember. So you have this j as a root mean square over root two. Whenever, whenever it's squared, it turns to be half. So this is a very simple equation in order to determine the total power losses inside any sheet or any surface, any surface uh, conductor. Now, in order to investigate this, we need to know two main parameters. The first is a sheet resistance, which is actually a, a material parameter. Whenever, if you, have a, if you are using copper or uh, silver or aluminum or whatever, then you will have a, a constant uh, resistance. This is maybe seven ohms per meter or uh, per meter or eight ohm or 15 ohm or whatever. And the second is a current. We need to determine this current, and I will call it JS. This kind of this is a surface current, my dear students. So we need to know the surface current. And in, if we know this surface current, then we can substitute over this equation and determine that J or the surface current. So, so now our next question is how to determine the surface current? Okay. Let's start, let's start with a general equation. And then let's proceed to our case. Generally speaking, the current J is defined as a unit vector N cross the H component. What is this N? I believe that you study this N three years ago when you were in EM1, when we asked you about what is, the a, what is the unit vector of a surface area? And you told us, okay, the unit vector of a surface area is simply a vector perpendicular on this area. So if this is an x, y plane, this, then this n will be a z n. So you have to first select your surface. Accordingly, you will, you will know that the, the, the vector describing this surface, which is the n vector, 
and then you will make a cross multiplication between this n vector and the h vector. Generally, h should be have an x and y and z component. However, in our problem, we only have h x and h z because h y tends to be zero for a t e one zero mode. If you remember, so what we are going to do now is simply we are going to find the surfaces and calculate the j per surface. So, in our rectangle and in our rectangular waveguide. This is our rectangular wave. As you can see, this rectangular waveguide consists of how many faces, how many surfaces? Actually, very simple. One, two, three, four. Very simple. So as we, as we know that this is the direction of propagation, Z, then this will be X and this will be Y, and this is A and this is B. Okay, so what are our surfaces? Let's just remind. So we have first the left surface, this one. So let me start using some coloring. So let's start with the left surface, this surface. This surface is defined by x equals zero. So when x is equals zero, which is this y z plane, so we have this one. And on the other side, you have another surface in the right direction, which is this one. So this is a equal a. And we have the bottom surface. I believe I have a good black belt. So this is Another surface, which is y equals zero. The bottom surface. And then finally, we have the top surface. Which is y equals b. So simply, as you can see, you have these four surfaces, and you can ca calculate the currents over these four surfaces. What you are going to do is very simple. It's very straightforward. Just first, decide in which surface you are going to calculate the current. Define your unit vector. Cross multiplication was h component. That's all. Very simple like that. So let's do an example for x equals zero surface. For the x equals zero surface, for this surface, the relation will be as follows. So Js at x equals zero equals. Oh, that's perfect. Okay. Okay. So first the unit vector. Again, the, v, the unit vector is a unit vector perpendicular on this red area. So simply, it's an x axis. So we have here what's called an ax or x cap, which is a unit vector. Cross the h component. Again, in our problem, we have only hx and hz. So hx ax plus hz az. But we know that ax plus ax is equal to zero. So this is the first zero. Then we, what we have is only ax cross az. ax cross az will give me us negative ay for hz. 
So now you can determine this j as component in the x equal to. Similarly, you can determine any other component for any other parent too. So let's turn back here. Let's turn back to our presentation and scan again what we have built. So again, open my pointer. So here we start with we have two types of attenuation, the electrical, uh, the electrical losses we already studied due to this complex primitivity epsilon dash minus j epsilon double lap, and we have the conductor losses. The conductor losses can be expressed in the term was the current sur surface current and the surface resistance or the sheet resistance. So we are interested in determining the surface resistance. For example, we start with x equals zero, and we will say that, okay, then this is the normal vector cross the h. So this is the normal vector cross h. This is what? This is hz. Let me check. Please remember. Okay, this is hz. a10 cosine y over ax e power minus j beta z. So simple like that. a10 cosine y, over, y x over a e power minus j beta z. Of course, the, herein we will substitute with x equals zero. So this cosine will turn to be equal one. And then finally, you have minus a10 e power minus j beta z in the ay direction. This minus actually came from the cross the cross uh, multiplication between ax and az. ax across az is with negative a. Similarly, you can implement the same procedure using the x equal a component. Similarly, typically, you will say that the, the normal vector is in the negative ax. This is a very important, a very important note again from your EM1 course that it's a normal to the surface area. So I told you half of the definition. Whenever you have an area, the vector representing this area is normal to the area and monitoring to the inside the device. So it's inside the structure. So when, whenever we have x equals zero, this uh, area, this uh, left-hand side, uh, left side area, the vector representing this area will be pointing toward the structure. So toward the ax. However, when you have x equal a area, which is the right hand side area, you will have a vector one pointing inside the device, which is a negative ax. That's why here we have a negative ax. Cross again az, so we will have this time a y. And now you will substitute with x equal a. So cosine by, cosine by is equal to one. So you have this shape. So then, then you have such a, a very interesting shape, which is cosine, uh, which is uh, Js equals a one zero e power minus j beta. Okay, so this is somehow very simple, very logic. Logic, uh, and finally we can repeat this for y equals zero, which is the bottom surface, and also for y equals b, which is the upper surface. So that's why now you can determine the surface current in the four both sides of your rectangular web. What's then next is then you will return back to the PS equation. But if you compare this equation, my dear students, with the original equation I, or, and I previously mentioned, you will find that this two is missing. We miss this two. This is simply because in each surface, in each surface, you have two identical surface. One is inside and one is outside. So simply the total power is two times this power. That's why we ignore or we, we, we couldn't see this two here. And now this is the integration over the current as you can see. Whenever you are in the J, in the Y the direction is the, the current in Y, you will make an integration with respect to Y uh, to, to Y. And whenever you have a current with respect to x, then you will make integration to with respect to x. Again, I'm not so interested with doing the mathematical steps step by step for this integration. You can just, uh, what is important is just determining the, uh, the, 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 the power, the overall power. But here, you, you can just see the, 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 the integration in the uh, Boser in chapter three. And then you will have this final relation illustrating the power losses. Again, this is, only a power losses 
due to the conductor. Here we assume that we have an ideal dielectrical material. So here we are assuming that we have an ideal uh, dielectrical material, or what we call it in your EM2 course, a low slit medium with only epsilon, epsilon dash, and we don't have an epsilon double dash. So this is simply the uh, definition, or this is simply the power losses. Now you determine the power losses, which is the power loss inside the uh, waveguide. And also, a few slides ago, we already determined what's called the propagating power, what we call the P10 power, or the power in the P10. Accordingly, you can define now what's called the attenuation coefficient alpha. The attenuation coefficient alpha, we call it here alpha C, to indicate that this is an attenuation due to the conductor, which is simply the losses power over the, uh, over the uh, propagating power. And then by dividing these two expressions, you can get this general term illustrating the, uh, the, the overall attenuation coefficient due to this um, uh, this waveguide per meter, as you can see here, which is the attenuation coefficient. You can do the same for any other modes. So, for example, in Bozar, you will find such a graph illustrating the attenuation coefficient versus frequency. But it's, of course, interesting that this attenuation coefficient is function in K, so it's a function in frequency. That's why you can plot such a graph illustrating that difference between different, the, sorry, the variation between the different attenuation coefficients and the different modes. Of course, for each mode, you will, you will find that the curve starts to be plotted after the cutoff frequency. So before the cutoff frequency, we don't have power. That's why we don't have, uh, we don't have a, a, an attenuation because simply this attenuation has, in, in, in its denominator, it has a power, and we agree that the power exists only if we have a real beta, which is the propagation condition for k is greater than kc, or what's called when the frequency is greater than the cutoff frequency. So, in a very simple manner, we can say that this is the graph illustrating the attenuation coefficient versus frequency for any or for different propagating modes. What we did, my dear students, for the TE mode, you can typically do for the TM mode. The only difference is will be in this manner that you will going to okay, let's turn back here. Okay, so here, if you remember, in our case, we start with this wave equation and solving for edges up, and then we determine the other four components. For the TM mode, you will just the only difference that you will start with this equation to determine is up, and then you will determine the other four, four, four components. It's a totally analogy, it's a totally symmetric solution. So I invite you, my dear students, to make by yourself that TM mood, I believe that also this will be implemented in the tutorial, so you can typically repeat our solution, but only substituting this edge that by EZ and determining the EZ component, and then return back to determine the transverse component. Okay, so as a final, uh, as a final stage in this lecture, I will just go quickly with two examples. One example, I will try to solve it somehow in detail. It's a very easy example. And then for the difficult example, I will turn it to you to discuss it and to explore the ideas. Maybe we can solve it also in the extra hours. The first example is a very uh, basic and very uh, easy an example. Here is our example. The example says the following. Uh, for an X-band rectangular waveguide having a dimension A equals to 1.07 and B equals 0.43, again, as usual, A is greater than B, find the cutoff frequency for the first five propagating modes, plot the field configuration for the TE11, maybe the, the field configuration plotting, where we will discuss this in the next part of the lecture. The next part of the lecture, by the way, will be fully dedicated to the field representation, how we can plot different fields. But now let's it's got the first part. Actually, it's a very easy, very directly solved part. We know this equation. So what you are going simply to, to do is simply, you know, here you can uh, assume a, a, an air as an electric material. Otherwise, we did not state a new a new and epsilon. So you will take mu node and epsilon node. A and B are given. So you can just directly sub substitute this 
in this equation. The substitution will be very easy. We will start with the very fundamental mood one, zero, then the next is two, zero, zero, one, 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 and two, one. Of course, this sequence, my dear students, is function in A and B. So it's not a static sequence. For example, and sometimes you can get that zero, one mood may be lower than the two, zero mood. This is simply due to NB. So it's a substitution issue. You can just substitute where with different conditions and see which, which one is the lower one and which is the higher. And then you can arrange your mood. So simply, as I mentioned, you can, by, by, substitution in this, by substituting in this equation, you can reorder the, 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 the mood based on the minimum cutoff and then the next and the next and the next. In all times, as far as A is greater than B, you will have the one zero moves as a fundamental. So this is a very basic and directly uh, what you can show a direct substitution question. So what is the next? Actually, the next, next is a very interesting question proposed by Bozer himself in the reference. What's called the partially loaded rectangular wave? It's a very interesting problem. Where you have your rectangular wave guide as usual with an A and B dimension, but Inside the rectangular waveguide, you don't have only one dielectric material, you have two dielectric materials. You have normally normal A, but for a portion with zero to T, you have another material with an epsilon R. With an, sorry, epsilon R, which means it has a new or another K. Now, what I'm inviting you to, to do is to start thinking about this solution. How we can use our general solution for a TE and TM mode using the Maxwell's equation in order to study that solution for this partially loaded rectangular wave. Maybe, as I told you, maybe if we have time, we can discuss some ideas in the extra sessions, but it's somehow a problem to you to be solved. This is the end for this part, my dear student. In the next part, it will be a fully demonstration part. We are going to go toward the demonstration or the plotting or the sketching of the electrical field and magnetic field component. And also we are going to investigate more about the demonstration of the surface current. We are going to use three ways. We are going to use papers and bands. We are going to use console multiphysics. We are going to use the previously implemented cell tool in order to make this full demonstration for both electrical and magnetic field components as well as the surface cut. Thank you, Martin, students, for your concentration, and see you in the next part, which will be most probably the final part with, the, with this rectangular wave guide lecture.